Thank you, everybody, for um, coming back to the online seminar series, Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. So we had, uh, had a short break after the, and now after the Easter break, we are uh, here back. Um, so today we have Professor uh, Wolfgang um, Hardel, um, who is uh, Ladislaus from Borkiev, uh, Professor of Statistics at Humboldt uh, University uh, in Berlin. Uh, we are very, very pleased to have uh, Professor Harder today, um, who has um, an impressive uh, um, uh, curriculum vitae, so more than 30,000 Google Scholar citations, ranging from his book on applied non-parametric regression in the 90s up to uh, very recent work on blockchain and cryptocurrency. Uh, Professor Harder has um, written uh, papers in very, very prestigious journals in the fields of statistics, finance, energy economics, etc., such as of Statistics and Journal of Econometrics. He is um, um, a key person in uh, the cost action on FICTEC and artificial intelligence in finance. And he is the World Package Leader um, on Transparency in FinTech which is basically um, a topic that has come up uh, here in this uh, online seminar series. We are very pleased that he um, accepted to um, give uh, a talk today. And uh, I would say, uh, Wolfgang, thank you so much. And uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dolores. Thanks to all the uh, organizers of the uh, NEEDS uh, network. It's really a great idea to have this network too bad that we cannot meet uh, on the beach somewhere or uh, here uh, on a boat trip in berlin but today we have to go by uh, this um, online format um, uh, thanks for this um, uh, wonderful introduction uh, i like to say in uh, always at that time it's a uh, oft, often it's a matter of luck to uh, to find uh, interesting uh, topics. And uh, it is exactly this uh, format of uh, networking that made me, uh, or that made me interesting, getting interested in, for example, cryptocurrencies uh, and uh, blockchain. And that is what you see here. You see the mouse, I hope, yeah? Uh, mm -hmm. You see the humble sign, then you see the blockchain research center. That's blockchain minus research minus center dot de. Uh, we are coming, actually, which you see on the very left side, uh, resource-wise, we are coming from a, a, a platform in Germany that is called ITG, International Research Training Group. That means we have a joint graduate school with uh, Xiamen University, which is the first econometric ski lab in mainland China. And that's the uh, logo of the university, Xiamen Dashi, uh, or Shada in short, uh, which is in Fujian province just across Taiwan. I'm also affiliated with the math and physics department at Charles University, and I am also a professor in, as a Yushan scholar at NCTU, uh, National Chautong University in Xinshu uh, in uh, Taiwan. And this talk uh, uh, is really uh, going back to very uh, fruitful discussions with uh, Kainat Kovaya, who will also, as a young researcher, give, as I understand, in this um, format uh, talk on generalized random forest and uh, uh, we decided to do it a little bit uh, uh, according to this network of uh, machine learning needs math by saying uh, random forest wonderful wonderful machine learning thing about 40 years old four zero yeah um, but we would like to understand it mathematically. And when we are going through that trespassing random forest, we found many things. That's why it says pointed stick for self-defense. And when you go to this link, or when you add a pointed stick for self-defense, you will find this Monty Python little um, uh, um, film uh, on self-defense that wants to say that actually a lot of things are known, but a lot of things are uh, have to be changed from the mathematics as we did it uh, 40, 30 years ago. Yeah, so um, what we are looking at is random forests where we are following 
decision trees and forests consist of um, uh, of wood and trees and uh, a, a bundle of sticks sort of the uh, the structure of the data uh, is really hard to break. We know a bunch of sticks is difficult to break. So the idea is of random forests of decision tricks to break one stick at a time. And I'm not showing you uh, this old 17th century illustration. I'll show you something more modern that you find in the card book, classification regression trees of Bryman, Stone, Olchen, and uh, Friedman from 84. Um, essentially, it said, instead of divide at, this, at impera, it said divide at, at divide at see the effect. This is correct. So we make sure that not all uh, trees learn the same. Yeah? So from data, we would like to get to a decision. And this decision um, will be uh, achieved in this random forest context. Uh, which is unfortunately mathematically very hard to uh, to uh, deal with. Um, that is why we call this trespassing random forest, because I will show you, but mostly based on uh, own work, work of uh, Buens Cornet, I will show you uh, how what is known and uh, how you can get deeper in the, in the understanding of uh, random forest. Now, to, I met uh, actually, uh, Leo Breimann in the 80s and Chuck Stone also. You have seen probably the um, abstract. Uh, I was professor at Stanford uh, a few years ago and uh, um, I discussed all the things that I'm doing uh, in this talk as well with them already. And the random forest idea came up from an inherent, uh, uh, say, uh, easy looking detail in decision trees, which I will comment. Um, later on. So technically, historically, um, random forests are based on decision trees and uh, can call it supervised learning for classification and regression. This is the modern term and what you are like to do is you divide one variable after the other into little decision um, elements. Yeah? And we are using an ensemble method, that means we grow the trees as base learners and then combine those to aggregate the uh, prediction. Here is a very nice little two-dimensional example where we would like to cut uh, this um, uh, surface here, the X1, X2 surface, so that it in a good way separates the blue from the uh, red dots. Yeah. Now comes the first, what I called a uh, little easy detail that really creates the headache for all mathematicians. That's this one. In the original description of the uh, decision tree, um, suppose you have a regression tree and then this would be uh, then nothing else than uh, a step function that you would like to approximate in this x1, x2 space. In the original um, definition of the of the card algorithm or decision tree algorithm, this s1 cut yeah, uh, was, de was defined as follows. We go along the x1 axis, we go along the x2 axis, and we just go through all the data points. We have n data points, so we go to all the x1 data points and check the variance to the left and check the variance to the right if you're talking about decision trees. So that means the cut itself is a data point. So that makes the original decision tree algorithm fantastically dependent on the original data that you are looking at. And that makes the math so difficult. Um, or you have to invent uh, uh, mathematical structures that help you to analyze this um, asymptotically. In the original card book, um, it's not much on asymptotics, but here in this talk, I will introduce you to uh, the things that at least uh, I know on it. <clears throat> so here we would use, for example, uh, this cut and we go on, and this is this divide at the side, yeah, divide at the side, and uh, we are cutting, 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 and finally, we are happy with our uh, decision tree, but again, do not forget these cuts could be stochastically seeing 
random variables that depend on the data configuration. So what we did is we were counting the number of variables that goes to the left and the right. Yeah? And then we have to make this uh, a decision on do I look at a regression tree, do I look at a classification decision tree, yeah? do, I, do I want to have uh, operation or not of this patient or is it just a, mathematically speaking, a step function or a hard wavelet uh, approximation to a conditional expectation of y given x. So you have different misclassification errors or, um, or you can call it impurity measures. And these will lead you to different cuts, of course. Now, this is where CART was standing. And then came bagging. Bagging contains the word bootstrap and aggregating. But the basic idea was like the original Efron bootstrap idea. It is to generate bootstrap samples, original data set. So we just boom, 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 boom. You repeat the original data set bootstrap wise. And then you construct several trees, uh, predictors for each sample, and then you just average them. <coughs> but that doesn't solve the problem. The problem is really a, a very old one, uh, as I said before. It actually goes back to a German economist, namely Ernst Engel, 1857, in his publications uh, on the um, Engel's law, as it's called in economics now, uh, the poorer families in German is in families and this is the That means the poorer families, a bigger proportion of the whole expenditure net income has to be spent for um, <clears throat> food. And he showed that actually with the so-called regressogram, as <clears throat> um, I, I called it later. Um, but in fact, it's nothing else than a um, oops, as a regression. Um, tree. The split criterion here uh, would be the squared error of variance, as I said. So, very old idea um, to use card and say step function approximations <coughs> excuse me, uh, to conditional expectations, which is also true, of course, for classification because the probability that you fall in a class is also <coughs> considerable as a conditional expectation. Now, here's the algorithm, which I will not read for you in detail. <clears throat> um, but the point is that the random forest allows you also not only to bootstrap uh, the whole data, it also allows to do sampling of the variables. That is the point. So the advantage is that an ensemble of decision trees of which each tree has its own selected, randomly selected variables, uh, as these two guys say, have been most successful in general purpose algorithm in modern time. But besides all the um, wonderful performance and the number of variables is high and uh, uh, without all these wonderful automatically um, um, a, a Python uh, or R code um, algorithms we can easily adapt to um, wonderful complex surfaces. Um, they are easily parallelizable, but we have not understood what they are actually doing mathematically. And so this is what I want to do in this talk. So the introduction was essentially I showed you it's an old idea, 1857. It has been for high dimensional data named card and later 10, 10, um, 20 years ago by Breiman and others expanded to re random forests, okay? And now I show you uh, the next, I show you Babylon, which is essentially the random forest that we need to uh, trespass. And um, then I will come to the mathematics that we can do and what I have done already. Um, and uh, I can share with Leo Breiman passionately exactly the same opinion. Um, <clears throat> this is why I must say honestly, that's why I uh, was not very successful <laughs> in German mathematics, because I considered statistics always as an applied field. And that's why I did a lot of econometrics and um, statistics for real data and finance data. 
I was very impressed by Bio and Scornet's paper. I think it's even published in TEST, which is the Spanish, uh, um, uh, which is the Spanish uh, uh, flagship uh, statistical journal. But uh, let me read this. Despite their widespread use, a gap remains between the theoretical understanding of random forests and their practical performance. This algorithm, which relies on complex data dependent, that's what they said. This is this little detail that was very hard. It's difficult to analyze, and its basic mathematical properties are still not well understood. <clears throat> All right, this state of affairs has led to polarization between theoretical and empirical contribution to the literature. Yeah? So empirically focused papers describe elaborate extensions of basic random forest, but come with no clear guarantees. But that's, you will see, you cannot come with clear guarantees because you cannot avoid the eternal Olympic God, you could say, rules, namely Chuck Stone's speed limits, which will be almost my last slide. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this is a very nice paper. Please read this. It's in test, I think, from Bio and Scone. Let me come to the lingo, random forest lingo in the Babylon. Uh, I'm sure you can do everything in sklearn and Python and uh, all coming from card backing I explained, but there are no random forests, there are purely random forests, median random forests, quantum random forests, generalized random forests, dynamic random forests, local linear forests, and I will all show them to you and uh, try to put them into the same uh, notational uh, framework so that we understand it better. Let me start with the purely random forest, right? So, uh, we start with a root, and at each leaf, we choose m tri variables uniformly, but it will be like card with the best split data dependent. Yeah? So, random, uh, purely random forest primer had the alternative idea to get rid of this data dependency to introduce a purely random forest. But he made life easier, so the root is just the unit cube. You can standardize the variables to min max and have it in a d dimensional cube. Then you select the smoothing parameter. Essentially, you're selecting um, a node to be split uniformly among all terminal nodes. Yeah? And um, <clears throat> I hope that my co author of that uh, um, uh, talk, uh, Kainat, is also here. She can probably answer your questions on that. Um, details later. The purely uniform random forest, which is about eight years ago, um, has been just analyzed for d equal to one, which is essentially the um, regressogram uh, situation of Ernst Engel from 1857. It's quite some time ago, right? Um, but they have wonderful results, could show for d equal to one, with the purely random forest where we are um, randomly choosing a node to be split uh, uniformly among the terminal nodes and then uh, randomly choose the split variable. We get it data independent. This randomness makes it data independent. And he was able to show consistency. Very nice result. And um, uh, Breiman also saw this little detail that uh, created that headache and he proposed a thing called the centered forest, which is an example of a purely random forest. So we are centering. That means we are always doing cuts directly in the center, independent of the impurity measure. We just center, center, center. And uh, Scornet proved in 2015 that this also leads to a consistent estimate for the conditional expectation. So you see already Babylon we had already four random forests now introduced. It continues. We have the median random forest, um, Devroy from 1996. So they didn't split in the center, they split at the median, right? And uh, he, they even could show that median random forest um, uh, in general is not consistent. But if you do some tricky stuff, with your observations without replacement among the original sample, you can actually uh, get consistency. Also, the individual trees are not, yeah, because it's this averaging 
that makes the consistency for you. Consistency is clear to everybody in the audience. And consistency is the fact that you are converging to the true conditional expectation or whatever functional of the conditional distribution y given x you have identified. That could be the conditional quantile, could be the conditional expectile, could be the conditional mean. Yeah. <clears throat> A very modern way is to orthogonalize the decision trees, but I don't know uh, any details. I just wanted to show you that there is really a zoo or a, say, a Babylonian uh, uh, language uh, um, diffusion, sort of maximum entropy <laughs> of um, random forest uh, lingo. Yeah, That is an orthogonal decision tree where you are trying to have all the trees independent of each other, like the principal components. Um, and by performing eigen analysis, you will be getting uh, uh, nice results. I have not studied them in detail. I just wanted to show you this Babylon thing. Mindhausen, also very nice, and I mentioned this already, any functional of the conditional distribution y given x, uh, you can use and say that you want to estimate it via a random forest, because random forests are nothing else than a bunch of step functions, uh, regressor grams, you could say, that you are averaging, so the averaging makes them finally makes it finally smooth. So uh, he used quantile regression, so he estimates the conditional quantile, again, with Lipschitz continuity. And very interesting is this recent paper in the Annals of Statistics by S.A. Wager and others, um, <clears throat> where uh, the functional is implicitly defined uh, through a, um, uh, you could say, uh, loss function or contrast function. Um, and um, they didn't think of Huberization, but I thought of it because I wrote my PhD thesis on robust regression procedure. And uh, I hope that the word Huberization uh, is uh, not really a um, problem for you, but I will explain it anyway. Uh, later. So generalized random forest, um, you technically, mathematically, a very nice stuff that Stephen Baker from Stanford to prove that uh, you have to calculate some pseudo outcomes that you actually don't observe, uh, but you can work with them and actually prove wonderful things that I will discuss also. We are still in Babylon. Okay, there's a dynamic random forest. Again, Babylon. There are thousands of random forests and many different mathematical approaches to um, estimate these functionals of the um, conditional um, distribution of y given x. And I love this one. This is the uh, based on an old idea of Dirichlet. Dirichlet is a mathematician from Humboldt University or Berlin University at that time. Uh, if you do this in Dirichlet's idea, Dirichlet gives you a distribution uh, that uh, integrates to one discrete distribution. It's one that's used in latent directly analysis and text analysis. But when you do this in D dimensions, it's called a Mondrian process, right? So you have a Mondrian process. So this is the kind of uh, car picture that you can think of uh, that of these um, separations in X1 and X2 have been done by a random mechanism. And they have also some very interesting, nice uh, results, but they have this choice of complexity parameter lambda, for example, not so clear. But let me come back now to trespassing random forest. So what is a random forest? A random forest is an estimator for a functional of the conditional distribution. Here's one. Chuck Stone, one of the authors of the card book, he has in his annals paper 1977, he proved the following. So take, let's take a weighted average. Yeah of the y's, locally weighted average. Yeah? You will see random forests are nothing else than locally weighted smoothers. Yeah? So Stone showed MN, this baby here, is consistent for, in this case, the conditional expectation if these conditions are fulfilled. Yeah? Very general theorem. Yeah? And um, that has been used, of course, in, uh, for example, proving this one. This is the Montreal forest, so that goes back to a theorem by Motada and Gaifas, uh, where they just assume the 
regression function is Lip Lipschitz, then you can bound, uh, no way how to choose lambda, I told you this is still open, but you can bound the mean integrated squared error, we could say, or the integrated mean squared error, or the mean average squared error, everything that you call risk in PAC language, which is possibly approximately correct, sort of the, 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 the mathematics for machine learning, you can bound it by some speed, and if you are, um, twiddling with the uh, speed um, uh, deviations in bias and variance, uh, you will see that the tickets error or this risk will go down uh, and the order n to the minus two divided by two d plus two, which will later be giving you the same thing, namely it will be later when we do this in for uh, other balls, right? This is exactly Chuck's speed. Chuck Stone's speed for Lipschitz balls. Lipschitz balls means you have p equal to one, so differentiable of order one, you could say Lipschitz is almost differentiable in d dimensions, but you see the problem. The problem is that these wonderful random forests, Mondrian, they have exponential growth when d goes to infinity. It's unavoidable, uh, and I call this the eternal Chuck Stone's limits. Yeah? You cannot avoid it. Yeah? You always have <coughs> bad rate of convergence. But why are random forests good? This is why are they good in practice? You will see. So this is trespassing random forests. <clears throat> we can also use it uh, to to end to enter some neural random uh, forest uh, framework that we put on. Um, uh, like a cork on a champagne bottle, you just put in another technology. And this actually, you can say this card tree is actually a two um, uh, neural network layer. And I mentioned uh, this book here before. This is everything in this book from 991. Uh, now, of course, this is the edition of 2019. Contains already uh, neural networks, perceptrons uh, for uh, financial time series, yeah? Here you see the uh, the way how it uh, the perceptron uh, is uh, laid out, um, and you can create a neural random forest. And it has been proven by Scornet that uh, when you calculate each tree independently, you get consistency. Yeah? And the same is true um, when uh, you use perceptrons. Again, you you get a consistency, but they need a wonderful mathematical assumption. And this mathematical assumption says, because everything is parallel, you cut off is parallel to the coordinate axis, right? So for a hyperact angle, yeah, and now you leave out the, the component j, yeah, you have to make sure that the function xj versus the function that you want to estimate, right, is constant over the interval in which the variable xj lives. And right? you have to assume that from here it follows that. Yeah. Very important assumption. Otherwise, you cannot prove anything, in, at least not in this setup. Now, which kind of Fs? Yeah, F is our big unknown thing, right? This is the big animal that we would like to approximate with random forest. How do we do it? The typical math answer is simplify so that you understand it. So which F does it? The answer is additive models, for example, do it. And you will see. It will come in uh, in a second. Sorry, I made a mistake here. Um, Spone proved that actually it is consistent in mean squared error. Yeah, wonderful. And additive models actually satisfy this dairy condition with this star that was funny. Additive models. What are additive models? Additive models are looking at functions. You could say balls. Yeah, Lipschitz ball. We had this word before. They are looking at functions that are additive. That means uh, this function is decomposed by the components fj, xj. So there are d functions that just operate on the coordinates. Yeah? And Chuck Stone has proved already uh, 1980 or uh, so that additive models have a one-dimensional rate of convergence. So if you think of Lipschitz, it would be n to the minus two-third. Yeah? And actually, that comes to the trespassing part. When I saw that, that uh, um, Scone used these wonderful additive models, I thought, gee, I have done that, uh, together with Zubakov, with Eno Maman, and Jen Jin Fan, 
um, Li Chen Yang. We have we have worked on. There is a lot lit a lot of literature going back even to 1993, where we study the backfitting uh, algorithm for additive models with convergence properties, etc. Okay, but not in this random forest context, but showing that the convergence, mathematically speaking, independent of D. Now coming to this implied functionals, yeah, uh, and I recur here on the work by essay, um, generalized random forest that you identify by generalized methods with moments. You can do this for quantile regression, treatment effect estimation, and uh, here's the example of her paper, and I give you some motivation out of the paper, um, what we can do with random forests. So they use random forests, uh, which you now you know are nothing else than approximators, that means estimators for uh, an implied conditional functional. In this case, they looked at the treatment effect of the number of children on labor force participation. So suppose you have a couple and you have two kids, right, here, unmarried couple, right? And so the target variable is, uh, did the mother work in the year before the census? So that means uh, actually if they get a third kid, right, uh, will the, she continue working, yeah? The third kid uh, is also mirrored with an instrumental variable by having first children of different gender. You have several covariates, uh, wonderful uh, empirical work, which they did with random force, <clears throat> and they showed these pictures. And then they said politically, hey, apparently it depends on the father's income, yeah? Uh, at first birth, uh, father's income uh, when the mother was 22 year old at first birth, because they said, this is the effect of income on the likeliness to go back to the worker force. And that made me a little bit um, nervous because these are shown as bands, but in fact, there are no bands. They are just a bunch of confidence intervals. They have a wonderful new statistic based um, uh, central limit theorem in the paper. Um, that lets you calculate the um, uh, length of the confidence interval. But we are working now with Chen Wang and Kai Nat, the co-author of the talk, um, on making it a uniform confidence band. Because I suspect that uh, the political momentum that you can create here, namely, hey, uh, mother doesn't go back to work as far, uh, go, go back to labor for if father has the money at first birth, right? I suspect the confidence bands are actually wider so that you cannot um, make a statement anymore. This is a suspicion of first to do the theory, but we are working on it. So how do we actually ID the curve, namely implied functional through GMM? Yeah, you do it by finding a correct function that identifies, for example, the, the um, um, expectile when, uh, random forest or the conditional expectation you can identify by minimizing this functional of the conditional distribution, which is equivalent to that when O is some of those functions that you see here, right? So for the blue uh, curve here with the dash, uh, it is exactly the mean. And for the slightly uh, tilted one, this would be a so-called expectile. The same for median and um, for now comes something that I want to show you. If you want to produce this picture, you just go to uh, LQR check, and this is all in our um, um, quantlet uh, um, technology. Yeah, you could even ask here, hey, have you worked on generalized random forests? The answer is yes, and you will see a film later. Uh, on exactly this uh, effective weight. You will see a film later that calculates the effective weights of a random forest in one and two um, dimensions. Okay, let me come back. This conditional expectation is actually calculated, uh, sorry, the, the, this conditional function here is actually corresponding to a pseudo maximum likelihood estimate that you can calculate from an A and D, asymmetric normal distribution. Uh, the quantile from an asymmetric Laplace distribution. <coughs> so you could say I'm working in an MLE. 
then people could ask you, what? Machine learning in economics? Then you have to say, no, I'm working in a classical maximum likelihood estimation framework. But we make a pseudo likelihood, it's exactly the same as uh, looking at this function, which is, of course, uh, the um, machine learning um, lingo. Now, come, we come back to things that you uh, probably have uh, seen how general this concept is. I call this the Hooverizing or the M-smoothing. So you could think, okay, I have my conditional expectation. I have some uh, conditional volatility variance, right? We have this error term, and this is exactly the formula, this argument E theta, conditional expectation, that you find in um, the recent papers that I mentioned, right? Uh, with a loss function rho, yeah? Um, in the quantile case, it just looks like that. So this would be the loss function. Um, and in general, though, what you're doing is you, you, you are calculating pseudo variables that are based on this psi function, which is nothing else than uh, rho prime. And uh, when you think of Huberizing, Huberizing means that, again, you have this quantlet here. You come to quantlet.com. Please try it out. After the talk, you are parabolic here and then linear. This would be the psi function. And this is the psi prime function. That gives you the linearization that you need to work in Stone's WNI framework. But in fact, it's very old. You go to a place in the Black Forest, right here, down here. There's a Mathematical Science Institute. I'm sure that everybody has been there. I've been there 35 times in my life. Uh, it's called Mathematisches Forschungsinstitut Uber Wolfach. Yeah? And when you go to the library here, you will find my PhD thesis. This is my PhD thesis. And you will find exactly this formula with psi and I use delta here instead of W. So it's a really an old problem, mathematically, but only for these very simple cases. Let me come now to my um, uh, iPhone. Yeah, You see my iPhone, right? This is the ideal function to see what random forests actually do. So suppose you work in two dimensions, and you see me through the iPhone, right? And there's no, in one direction, in X2, in this direction, there's no reaction at all, it's just constant. Yeah? But in the x1 direction, you have a little triangle. This is what this function does. So you are in two dimensions, yeah? but your conditional expectation or the function that you want to estimate is just dependent on one variable. And that shows why random forests are good in practice. Because as you will see now, they are just local smoothers, local adaptive smoother. They adapt automatically through boosting, or you could call it uh, uh, impurity measure. So let's go from left to right. Let's go from left to right across my iPhone pa package here, right? You see that? Go from left to right. And these are the effective weights. <clears throat> that means in you are approximately, technically, you are approximating the random forest <coughs> Estimates are theta wiggles. You cannot observe them. But it's equal to the true regression function plus a weighted sum of epsilon i wiggles. And these epsilon i wiggles you also don't observe. These are pseudo errors. Yeah? Um, <clears throat> but this theta wiggle is so close to the final random forest that you are done. So I'm showing you the alpha i. Of course, now only alpha one. You see what happens? Now minus 0 0.2, and it goes down. So you understand. It looks like a kernel estimator. This is what's Corney proved, right? And in two dimensions, you look, it broads up, and then it becomes very small because we are only we have a reaction only in one direction. So and then it goes further. Again, please. Visit our quantlet.com page. Look for GRF effective weights. We have the R code there to make those two pictures. Yeah? OK. So what did Scone actually prove? So um, he had a lot of assumptions. And uh, this brings me almost to the talk end here. So don't swallow this too fast here. But essentially, random forest estimates are um, estimates for a repeat, of course, m times. This is the repetition, right? But they look like kernel estimators or people that are 
known to Kerbal estimators, not high Watson estimators or whatever. And Scone proved that uh, these random forests are kernel estimators. <coughs> you can control somehow the observations in each cell is a very, very nice um, step forward. Okay, so this is almost the last uh, slide here. So random forests are local kernel estimators, but they cannot escape Chuck speed limits. Yeah. If we calculate the convergence rates in a min max framework, we all have to follow the eternal Charles rule. So a very small ball, like the Lipschitz ball is big, right? And so that's why the convergence rate in D dot one would only be n to the minus two third, yeah, for million squared error. When you make two 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 derivatives, it would be n to the minus four fifths. If you make eight derivatives, it would be n to the minus sixteen divided by um uh, 33, yeah? So it would converge if if you have infinitely um, uh, differentiable functions, which nobody has ever seen in his life, then you have almost uh, the, up to a log term, you have almost the parametric rate of convergence, which is of course n to the minus one. But Chuck's speed limit, that is Chuck Stone uh, from UC Berkeley, yeah? Uh, he said, essentially, if you are using what every statistician actually does, we are trying in a game theoretic way, we are trying to minimize our maximal loss. This is the mean integrated squared error, or it was called R before. We are using this maximum over a functional class because we don't know what God has given us as a function. Yeah? So this functional class will depend on P, some dimensionality, or you can call it uh, the uh, Wapnik Chavonenki's. Uh, um, uh, bound or whatever it is will be depend on the number of derivatives. That's how I would uh, have parameterized in this talk. And then you look for an estimator that makes this small. And then you can actually show this rate is achievable. And the Chuck Stone speed limit says, no way you can escape. It's always n to the minus 2p divided by 2p plus d. So the Olympus right, that means the gods are right. That means the mathematics is true. Random forests cannot escape the eternal rules. Yeah. And non-eternal optimists like we human beings, yeah, and statisticians, we can probably work on smaller balls to make this functional class small to get rid of this D, yeah, like additive models, they will do the job. But you can never escape the speed. But why is it good to do your sudden forest? Because random forests are local bandwidth, they provide you, as you have seen in this example on my iPhone here you have seen that the bandwidth got smaller when it saw that there is some response. Yeah? Uh, and that is the power of random forest. So it lets you see uh, the correct, um, say, uh, dimension. But if we want to attack such things as mathematicians, as non-eternal optimists, because we are no gods, we have to use other uh, balls, other functional classes to um, go uh, beyond Chuck's lim uh, speed limit. So in the words of the founder, Leo Breiman, the cleverest algorithms are no substitute for human intelligence and knowledge of the data and the problem, but don't take it as absolute truth, but as a smart computer generated guess that may be helpful in leading to deeper understanding. So you understood my way was from uh, Trespass introduction random forest trespassing through the Babylon, yeah, showing what has been done already, and then so seeing it was actually an old problem, even going back to my PhD thesis in terms of Huberization, yeah, um, which was eighty two, um, and finally uh, I show you this little Monty Python flying stick thing, right, and this wonderful. <laughs> Okay, I hope you didn't find this too much of pointed sticks <laughs> uh, hitting on random forests, but I think we have a, lo a long way to go as um, mathematicians before we actually get a grip uh, on um, uh, everything that this wonderful computer-based uh, technique actually uh, offers us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your uh, very um, impressive uh, presentation um, with the Babylon 
um, also with your contribution. <laughs> you like you like the Babylon again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, I think what we do is we open um, the floor for uh, questions. So um, if uh, anybody from the audience would like to um, pose a question, please uh, raise your hand. Um. I hope Kainat is there so she can help me. Kainat, are you here? No. Yes, but I'm here. She is here. <laughs> okay, good. That's I don't see good. you. Where are you? Your, your picture here. on there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, we have a question from uh, Sinia. So if you would like to um, yeah. unmute and yeah. I'm ready to uh, use my question. Yes, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I didn't see so many uh, different random forces yet. So uh, now I ready <laughs> to continue my study of random forces. But my question to you is about uh, consistency. And I saw a lot of uh, good results. But my question is, do we need to assume any um, distribution of our data for proving this consistency? Or we are in a non-parametric world when we use random forest? Yeah, so let me answer this without going back to the talk, uh, if you uh, agree. Um, we are in a classical setup. We have a non parametric situation. We are doing, we have data. We want to estimate some functional. Let's talk about, say, the conditional expectations, some functional of the uh, conditional situation of y given x. Yeah? So conditional expectation is one. You can call it a smooth regression curve. And that means you are trying to approximate. A function which you can do only locally, of course, in non-parametric setting, um, through a bunch of step functions that you are locally averaging. That makes them then finally smooth. That's what you saw in the film. Do you remember the film? It was not like in regressogram. Yeah, it was not a decision tree thing. It was not step functions. It was smooth little weights. Yeah, they come from averaging step functions. And so you are, in fact, in a non-parametric setting. So what Kone did, uh, he just uh, uh, and uh, showed that the effective weight, which I called uh, alpha, yeah, in that talk, fulfilled uh, Chuck Stone's conditions, and then he is done. Okay, so I uh, thank you. I understood that we don't need to suppose any distribution uh, for consistency. Oh, yeah, of course not. Yeah, yeah. You, you need, of course, you need something like it's. Uh, it's like asking, uh, do we need? Uh, what are the assumptions for the strong law of large numbers? The same question. Here, okay. just locally, so you have to make because you're having a function or a constant in the strong law of large numbers. You have a constant. Uh, life is easier. So if you do. Um, uh, Non-parametric regression, you have to take care of the curvature, so you, it has to be minimal Lipschitz, right? You cannot jump, yeah. otherwise you will not get consistency. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, uh, Senior. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? I think it was uh, uh, senior. Yeah. Would you? Would yeah. You? Uh, just uh, yeah. Uh, second question is maybe a small one. Um, no, no, no. I know that for non-parametric methods, it's uh, very difficult to handle uh, highly dimensional data. Uh, can you <laughs> say something about yes. that? Is that a problem here or not? That was my last slide. We are yeah, uh, so we are damned to follow Chuck's speed limit. Let me show it again. Maybe uh, then it becomes uh, uh, clear again. Um, we have no chance to escape it. We have no chance to escape the uh, curse of dimensionality. Yeah, no chance because we are as as long as we are. This is the curse of dimensionality. This D here oh. is what I wrote here. 
a very small ball, that means this maximum goes over a small set, yields increased precision. So that means if I increase P, I get better rates of convergence. But dimension D hits you exponentially hard. Or you could call it this way, the since uh, non-parametrics is always based on local averaging. You got a problem in high dimensions because the d-dimensional unit ball is essentially empty. So you have not enough observations there. And when you ensure that you make have enough observations there by saying I use k nearest neighbors, right? Then you got a bias problem because you are averaging over things that are uh, you are averaging the k nearest neighbor over structures that are probably um, there to be found. Yeah? And you will find them much later, meaning again the rate of convergence will be slow. So you cannot avoid that. No way. But they are good. Okay, let me show you where they are good. Again, so they are good because uh, let's have a look here. This is like a, a kernel estimator that goes over time. So we are just estimating this triangle. You see my mouse? Yes, yes. Yeah? Yes. This is minus one, one, right? Okay. I'm actually sitting right here. You see also the flag in the background, yeah? Okay. So now I'm starting from the left and I'm just doing random forest. And I take from my R code, I take those alphas out. That's all I do. And this is the alphas for 500,000 and 2,000, I should say. That's why uh, they have different colors, right? So I use 500 data points, 100 data, 1,000 data points, and 2,000. You saw it? And when you do it in two dimensions, uh, the, you should only see a reaction here in this region from minus 0 0.2, because data is 0 0.2, from minus 0 0.2 to 0 0.2. Yeah? You see, it goes in both directions, and then all of a sudden it gets smaller. Yeah? Because now it feels the peak. Yeah? It feels the peak, which you saw here as well, right? Okay, let me show you again. Does this explain to you? And this local averaging that I do here in two dimensions is a, uh, uh, say, um, a very difficult um, uh, task in high dimensions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, in, yeah. In the, now in the sense yeah. of this rate of convergence. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I now I see this uh, D in the formula. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. <laughs> the limits with the Z, yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I will um, ask one more, otherwise, um, yeah. Is there any other question from the audience? So I think it was a very thorough presentation. Um, we thank you very much for um, yeah, taking us through um, uh, lots of literature around random forests and also for giving us, um, um, say, open questions for, uh, for the future to better understand the math of uh, random forest. Mm -hmm. um, it has yeah, been so a pleasure. Yeah. And uh, to the audience, uh, we hope to see you back um, um, next week when we will have uh, the presentation of Ruth Meisner. Okay, and um, I can recommend the talk of uh, Generalized Random Forest by Kainat. It will come in May or so, right? Yeah. All right. Yes. Yeah, thank you so Thanks much. Uh, um, we hope to um, yeah see you um, soon at another event. Thank you. I, I try hard. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.